Welcome from the City University of New York to our new Academic Technology Research and Development Podcast. My name is Adam Wandt. I'm the Faculty Fellow for Online Learning at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Chair and Senior Researcher of the CUNY Skunk Works Academic Technology Research and Development Group. I'm here today with Philip. I'm Phil Pecorino. I'm a professor of philosophy at the City University at Queensborough Community College in the School of Professional Studies. Together with Adam, we co-founded this research and development group, which is a team of faculty and staff who come forward in order to assess the technologies used in higher education. Our goal in this podcast is to bring you a monthly update on the latest trends in academic technology spanning across the City University of New York and beyond. Today, we will start with an interview of Dean George Adi, who's the Director of Academic Technology at the City University of New York. We will then go to an interview with Anthony Pachano, who is Professor and Executive Director of the PhD Program in Urban Studies at the City University of New York. We'll also hear from Sebastian August. Sebastian's a graduate student at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and he'll be talking with us about what academic technology means to students of today. Well, welcome, George. I want to thank you for being here with us today. We have a couple of questions to put to you. Advances in information technologies, you know, have impacted all of our social institutions. Higher education is no exception to that. And with higher education, we've seen some of those technologies transformed into what today we just call educational technologies. So I'm asking you what you think of this interaction as far as it's had an impact what are the most lasting or the deepest consequences it's likely to have at the most fundamental level for what we do in higher education? Well, Phil, I, I think I would, I would uh, divide those, those technologies that you mentioned and those interactions into to three broad categories. Uh, presentation, creation, or at least representation, representation, uh, and uh, interaction. And I think probably the, the best example of the first of those is, going back to the 15th century, publication of the book. And uh, the book at that time transformed education because, and we can excuse this because not that many people were able to read, we thought that the book uh, said what it said, that knowing what the book said was enough. Now we know that it's what the book means, interpretation, application, and so on. Uh, so there was a time when teachers were worried that they would sort of be automated out of existence or published out of existence, but they, they came in very handy for that. And when we moved to the web, a lot of this content went into digital spaces, but also a wonderful thing happened, which is that users, people who originally went there just to find stuff or see stuff or read stuff, found that they could do stuff and create stuff. And that's a, a huge transformation, not least of all in the educational realm, where users are able to produce as well as consume. Um, that's had an enormous impact. Uh, finally, there's interaction. Um, and uh, I have to say that this was arguably the largest of these. And it happens in so many modes and so many media that uh, I get dizzying just dizzy just feeling uh, our way through the possibilities. There's student-to-student -student interaction, student-to-teacher interaction, there's group work, there's real-time or immediate interaction, there's asynchronous or deliberative and reflective interaction. What's fascinating about this is that this communication is also sharing. And so it takes those other things, those ways of presenting knowledge and creating knowledge, and blowing them out and, and making them shared and making them widely available. Um, you asked me which I thought was the most important. I think it would probably be the interaction of all three, mm -hmm. that we develop effective resources and content that become effective practices, and then we share those. And it's that sharing, ultimately, that is the most important thing. You brought up important considerations, and along with them, there are forces driving the use of these technologies, particularly in large urban institutions such as the City University. Well, what's driving it forward is, is change with a capital C, not just technological change, but economic, social, cultural change. Employers are expecting uh, students to have some facility with new technologies. Professors are interested in improving their pedagogy that way, and students are used to using them, even before they come to us. 
What's slowing it down, I think, is, is the change is hard. It meets with resistance, technology is expensive, but I think we're dealing with very different dynamics here, too, that innovation happens at the edges with individuals and their ideas. Resource management uh, demands consolidation and control. And what you really need is something that's not just grassroots, because then you have random acts of innovation, and is not just top-down, because it'll be meet with resistance and a lack of buy-in. You need something that's shared, understood, has communities of practice built around it. And again, technology aids and abets in, in helping that to happen. Do you think it improves access and opportunity for people in multiple ways? I, th I think it, they have that experience, and if they have that experience, it reinforces the utility and the use of that. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today and, and sharing your reflections and ideas. And perhaps you'll join us uh, on another occasion. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Pichiano. You've been involved in higher education for over 44 years. What are your fondest memories dealing with academic technology and online education during that time? Well, it's a good question, Adam. Um, I've had a lot of experiences, and I kind of put them into two categories, one as an administrator and one as a faculty member. As an administrator in the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, I built computer centers. I was involved with teams that built computer centers in places like Hunter College in the Bronx, mm -hmm. Lehman College, Meg Revis College, College of Staten Island, SUNY New Paltz. Um, as an academic, I have to say that uh, my fondest memories were definitely the work I did with online learning when I was part of a group of faculty at the Open Systems Lab at CUNY. Uh, we were basically given a charge to use technology and whatever we learned to share it with others. And out of that grew my first uh, dabbling with online learning in 1996. Uh, I brought a, together a group of my graduate students at Hunter College and I suggested to them I think we can teach an online course and they looked at me as if I was crazy. <laughs> um, but we actually did it and in uh, spring of 1997 we developed uh, the first online course. That is uh, absolutely incredible for 1996 and 1997. Uh, uh, you really were a leader of your time. Thank you. But what was very funny about that, there was probably about two or three other faculty around the university that were exploring online learning. And so right after I offered that course, in June of 1997, the Professional Staff Congress, and supported by the University Faculty Center, Center, uh, Center University Faculty Senate, declared a moratorium on any distance learning in the university. Wow. So basically, the moratorium was against myself, my graduate students, and two or three other faculty. Uh, but it was, right, it was the right thing to do because we were moving into an area where the university had absolutely no policies, no procedures. Yeah. And uh, it was the start of a very interesting series of meetings between the uh, PSC, the University Faculty Senate, the administration, from which we developed a series of um, procedures that would allow us to continue that was endorsed by all parties throughout the university. And part of that, I remember, I was asked to go around to the various colleges to explain what I was doing. And it turned out to be a very, very rewarding experience because rather than a lot of pushback, I was getting a lot of curiosity and interest in how to do it. So it's kind of like the grassroots movement where it you was. went there in person and you talked to, was. Talk to was. faculty and in person. And what was really nice was about a year later, we got a lot of funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to basically develop faculty, uh, which we called, we called the, the, the program CUNY Online, uh, but it was basically a professional development program to, to train faculty throughout the university to develop online materials. Uh, and, and I think as a result of that, I mean, I'm sure that uh, Maybe uh, George Adi has some data on this, but I think we, we trained several thousand faculty through that program over the years. That's absolutely incredible. You're, you're heavily involved with the Sloan Consortium. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, the uh, Sloan Consortium, my first involvement was in 1996. Uh, I received a very modest grant uh, of about $19,000. And I came in with this proposal that for some place like Hunter College, the issue wasn't geography as the distance, it was time. And I developed my proposal around this theme of the busy urban professional. 
That's something uh, that's carry forwards to today. And that and that turned out to be one of the first grants they funded of that ilk, and it has turned out to be. If we look at distance learning today, the the distance of time is as important as the distance of geography. What do you think is the biggest lesson you have learned in our move from traditional learning to the online classroom? Without a doubt for me, it has been that it is the pedagogy that's what's most important, and it's the pedagogy that should drive the technology. Uh, we've seen, and, and today especially, we have a lot of wonderful software tools that we can use. But when I first started using some of this technology, and it's not just the online stuff, but even the work I did in the 70s and 80s, uh, we had very rudimentary tools, absolutely no course management systems or anything of, of that uh, sort. But if you had good pedagogy, you can make the, the technology a really good experience for teaching and for learning, if not enrich the teaching and learning experience. And another thing I learned is that it has to be something that the faculty enjoy and the faculty want to do as much as the, the students learning. If the faculty do not really uh, feel comfortable, if they are uh, dubious about this, uh, you have to work with them to get over those, those, those concerns. And I remember that um, when, we, when we started the CUNY Online and we started working with faculty, our questions were never, this is the technology and this is how you use it. Our questions were, why do you think you're a good teacher? How do you know your students are learning? Uh, what is the best technique you use to get students engaged in your material? Right. So we built around all of the pedagogical bases that were something personal to the faculty we were working with. Well, we want to thank you for joining us here today. Uh, you have some wonderful experience, and I am looking forward to hopefully interviewing you again in the future. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, Adam. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome back. We're here with Sebastian August. Sebastian is a graduate student in the Master of Public Administration program at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He is one of our leading student technologists. He serves on the President's Technology Advisory Committee and the Student Technology Fee Committee. Thank you for joining us, Sebastian. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So as a student, what does academic technology mean to you? Well, academic technology means to me uh, being able to use my devices for uh, student for uh, student things in the sense of reading my papers that I have for classes on my iPad or doing my homework on my laptop. Do you use any of your devices to keep in touch with your professors or fellow students? Uh, yes, I use my iPad and also my uh, laptop to email with professors if I have any questions. And also I use my phone and sometimes my, I, uh, my iPad to uh, keep in contact with students if we want to work together on certain projects. Now, as a student, you also have some experience with podcasting. You've made up podcasts for yourself, and you've helped other students make podcasts for their courses. Yeah. What do you think about using podcasts in the classroom? Well, I think it's a, a new uh, look or new aspect when it comes to technology. Uh, education doesn't uh, stay still. It keeps evolving as time goes by. So I just feel like this is a great uh, new way to use uh, to re innovate uh, education. So what's your favorite device out of all the devices that you have? I would have to say my iPad, just because uh, a lot of times professors have a lot of readings for class. And instead of uh, spending so much money printing out hundreds of pages, I can read all of them on my iPad and just flip through the pages uh, easily. Are you digitally connected with your college? Do you communicate with John Jay on Facebook? Well, I do not use uh, John Jay. I do not, uh, I'm, I'm not connected with uh, John Jay on my Facebook. But I am connected with them on uh, CUNY Alerts as well as Twitter. Why don't you communicate with John Jay on Facebook? Well, Facebook is more of a personal thing, and I keep my personal and my academic life separated. But when it comes to Twitter, I do have an uh, academic Twitter account, which I use to uh, keep in contact with John Jay. Tell me a little bit about the CUNY Alert system. Um, before the, sh we, the taping, you were mentioning that it came in handy during Hurricane Sandy. Yes. So tell us a little bit about this CUNY Alert system. Well, the CUNY Alert system is uh, something that uh, John Jay has, as well as I think all the CUNY schools. Um, and you set it up by uh, signing up for it and putting in your phone number. 
And what happens is they send you any type of alerts that may occur at the school, whether it be a, a school day cancellation where there's no classes or there's a situation where uh, there's a problem in one of the buildings. Um, during Hurricane Sandy, it was used to uh, let students know that there were no classes. And also, um, if needed, there was um, help at John Jay. I think that it was really important that we got the message out there to the students that John Jay could be used as a shelter and there was help here. Mm -hmm. One final question. Yes. Where does somebody like you get your tech news from? Well, um, I get it from a variety of places, um, mainly uh, Wired.com. I use uh, TechCrunch as well as Engadget and other uh, websites and other places. Very cool. Sebastian, thank you for joining us. Thank we you. We appreciate you coming in for our podcast, and we're looking forward to getting you involved again in the future. Thank you. Well, Adam, that just about does it for this time. I know we thank our guests for being with us. We learned a lot from them. We hope all of you learned something as well. And I know we're looking forward to our future podcasts. Absolutely, Phil. Thank you for joining us as guest host this time. Next time, our podcast will be exploring learning management systems. Our guest host will be Helen Kaya. Helen is the manager of LMS Support Services at John Jay Online. We hope to see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube feed for further updates. See you next time.